pastors of the churches in Ephesus together. And so we don't know how many there were, but there was a lot of people. And they came together. And Acts chapter 20 is his minister's conference. It's where he's talking to them. And he's talking about that he's on his way to Jerusalem. He's just not sure what's going to happen to him except that the Holy Spirit is telling him that everywhere he goes, there's going to be bonds and afflictions. And he had a dread uh, about what was going to happen. And he told these people, I'll probably never see you again. And he talked about how he had suffered so much. And I'm going to break right into the midst of this. But in verse 24, after he had been talking about all of these things, he says, but none of these things move me. And this is really important. Neither count I my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Well, there's a lot in that verse. I've preached for two and three hours on that verse. But what I wanted you to see is that he said he wasn't moved by all of the things that happened to him. You know, the people that are here at this conference, uh, you aren't your nod to God crowd. You aren't the Sunday only guys. Here you are taking a weekend out. You're coming here and you're sitting under the word hours a day. I believe that all of you here want to make your life count. You want to see God move in your life. You want to see improvement and stuff. But you know, the average person does not have a confidence or an assurance that they are going to be able to fulfill that. And it just depends on what comes against them. I have meant, I've known so many people that their heart was right. They wanted the things of God, but you couldn't count on them. Uh, you know, I travel and go to churches and, and usually I'll go to one church a year and then I'll come back the next year. And you can't count that many of these people are still going to be serving the Lord, still maintain their joy and stuff. They have a good desire. They want the things of God, but they just don't seem to have the ability to make it happen. You aren't sure. And there's multiple reasons, but one of the biggest ones is just like Paul is saying here, he was talking about, he knew that there was tragedy. He knew that there were things going to happen. Turns out when he went to Jerusalem, he was arrested, spent two years in prison and then was shipwrecked on his way to Rome, spent two years in prison in Rome. And we don't have a scriptural account, but the a uh, secular account or extra biblical account says that he was released, went to Spain, then was imprisoned and killed again or, or beheaded in Rome. And so uh, anyway, it was tragedy and he knew that some of these things were happening or coming, but he says, none of these things move me. How could, how could he do that? How could he guarantee that regardless of what comes his way, he was going to be uh, on target, he was going to fulfill what God called him to do. And this is a tremendous key right here. He's given us insight into himself. None of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself. If you find a person who has dealt with their selfishness, dealt with themselves to the point that they have died to themselves so that God is more important to them than the self, did you know that that person, it is just, it's amazing how that equips you to be able to go on with God. All of the things that Pastor Greg Moore was talking about, the fear of finances, the fear of friends, the fear of family and failure and all of these things that he listed. Did you know that fear has no place in your life if you don't hold your life dear unto yourself? If you have a cause, if you have a goal, something that is bigger than you and it's not all about you, then it just changes your approach towards everything. Satan's weapon against us is this self-centeredness, our fear of self-suffering something. And when you just come to a place where you turn yourself over to the Lord and make yourself completely available to him so that whatever God wants is fine. If he wants you to be the custodian, and clean. But if that's what God wants you to do, you are just absolutely pleased with that. It's not about how many awards you have on your shelf and all of these things. It's not about the recognition of people. When you get to where you have dealt with self, it just uh, equips you to be able to do things. And this is what Paul is saying. He says, the reason none of these things moved him was because he didn't count his life dear unto himself that he might finish his course with joy. 
I don't know if I'll get around to talking about that, but that is another thing is it as long as you are seeking your own happiness and it's all about you being promoted and you being safe and you being taken care of, self is like a drug addiction. And whatever it is that satisfies self, it doesn't last. You have to start getting a bigger dose. You got hooked on it and you just never can satisfy it. I've never done drugs, but I've had people talk about it. And, you know, you take a hit of something and it gives you a high. But if you continue to do it, you'll get to where that doesn't satisfy you. And you've got to increase it. And it's got to get more and more. And that's the way self is. You can never satisfy self. Self is like an addiction. And the moment you start establishing that you are going to take care of yourself and that this is the goal is to promote self, take care of self at all costs, you have just got on a treadmill where you're going to go faster and faster and faster and get nowhere and it just causes problems. Paul is saying that the reason he wasn't moved is because he didn't count his life dear unto himself. This is how he finished his course with joy and it is just, it is the key. You've got to get over yourself. You've got to get something bigger than yourself. Man, that is a huge statement. And you know what I want to minister on tonight? I want to turn over to Galatians chapter 5. But let me just go back and give a little bit of my testimony. Many of you have heard me say this, but it's what happened to me and it never changes. And so it's the same. So whether you've heard it or not, it's the truth. But I got born again when I was eight years old. I got genuinely converted. My dad led me to the Lord in my bedroom. The next day in school, I was made fun of for being a Christian. It was evident enough that my friends could tell something happened. And I mean, I was changed at eight years old. And I have sought God my whole life. I've never gone away from the Lord. I'm not saying that for uh, patting myself on the back. I'm just telling you where I'm coming from. I have always been seeking after God and desiring to have a relationship with God. But the church that I was in taught just like brother Dave was saying that you got to live it and you've got to be holy and God moves in your life based on your performance. And so I tried to perform better than anybody I knew. Matter of fact, I never had a pastor that, uh, you know, lived as holy as I did. I lived holier than anybody I knew. I'm just about 66. I've never said a word of profanity, never taken a drink of liquor, never smoked a cigarette. I've been seeking God my whole life. And um, I was doing all of these things, but it was just never enough. It was, you know, well, you need to do more. You need to be seeking a little bit harder. And I was trying all of these things, but I was looking to myself and my performance and thinking that God would move in my life because I was doing all of these good things and I was better than other people that I knew as far as, you know, these outward sins, the big 10 that everybody talks about. And so I was trying to live holy and it led me into being a Pharisee and thinking that I was better than other people and stuff like this. And so I was born again when I was eight, but when I was 18, I was in a Saturday night prayer meeting. This is what we did every night for years. All of my friends, we would get together on Saturday night and pray from 10 till 11 o'clock at night. That's what we did as 18 year olds. I'll give you an indication that I wasn't <laughs> like everybody else. And uh, we did that for years. And anyway, it's a long story. I won't go into the whole thing, but God just opened up my eyes and opened up my heart and showed me that if I was going to trust in my goodness, then he just showed me his glory. He showed me his holiness. And in comparison to him, man, I was unworthy to the max. And I mean, I didn't know this. I honestly was thinking I was living a really holy life and I was very smug about how holy I was living, but God, I don't have the words to explain this to you. I didn't see anything. I didn't hear anything with my ears, but in my heart, I saw God. I saw the glory of God. God revealed himself. I was in the pure, holy presence of God. And every time you find this happening in the Bible, people would throw themselves on the ground 
and acknowledge their unworthiness. Isaiah in the sixth chapter saw the Lord high and lifted up and he said, Oh Lord, I'm a man of unclean lips and dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And he just cried out for mercy. You can see that Peter, when he saw the Lord on the shore, he drew his fisher's coat unto him and threw himself into the water. He was naked and realized his unworthiness. You can see on the, on the Isle of Patmos when John in the book of Revelation saw the Lord. He fell at his feet as if he was dead. And you just can't find a single instance in the word when somebody really encountered God that they just were smug about who they were and stuff. Compared to God... There aren't any of us that look good. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I, again, God just revealed himself to me. And when he did, I saw my relative unworthiness to him. I saw the hypocrisy of me taking credit and uh, proud of my accomplishments And it just devastated me. I was in front of all of the leaders of the church. I was in front of all of my friends. And man, I just turned myself inside out and started repenting and asking God to forgive me for my uh, being a Pharisee and my hypocrisy. And I didn't even realize I was like that until God showed up. And it wasn't verbal. I just knew compared to the glory of God that I was in, that I was super unworthy. And I didn't know those things until the Lord showed me. But you know, Jesus talked about if you look on a woman and lust after her in your heart, you're guilty of adultery. If you get angry, you're guilty of murder. If you even think it, you're guilty. I hadn't done the outward acts, but I had lusted and I'd done all of the other things. I was just as guilty and... I didn't even realize that, but when in the presence of God, I started confessing all of these things in front of the leaders of the church, in front of my best friends. I told them thoughts and attitudes that I'd had that I'd, I wasn't even aware of until God showed up. And I humbled myself the best I could. And at that time, I was taught that God was the one that killed my dad when I was 12 years old. I was taught that God is the one who punished us. I had a wrong impression of God. And I honestly thought that God showed up and I was in his glory and I thought God was going to kill me. I thought I was going to die that night. But right before he killed me, I was going to confess everything I could think of hoping that praise God, when I died, I'd go to be with the Lord. And I mean, I didn't care about anybody else. I confessed stuff for over an hour and a half, I just repented and bawled and squalled. I was a mess just laying in a heap on the floor. I don't know what everybody else thought, but man, I was just overwhelmed. And what really changed my life was that after I repented of everything I had ever, ever thought or ever will think, I confessed everything. After I did that, I just, there was nothing left to say. And I was just laying there wondering what response God was going to have. And instead of wrath or rejection, I had a supernatural God kind of love come over me for four and a half months. I was just caught up in the presence of God. I didn't eat or sleep consciously for four and a half months. I couldn't. Charles Finney said it was like waves of liquid love coming over him. I mean, I was overwhelmed with God's love and it was wonderful, but it was really confusing because everything I'd ever been taught was that God loved you when you did good and when you earned it and when you were worthy of it, God loved you. And I was trying to be good enough to have God pour his love out in my life. For the first time in my life, I realized I didn't deserve a thing. I deserved to go to hell. I deserved to be judged. And for the first time in my life, I had realized I didn't deserve a single thing. And that's when all of the love came. It just ruined my theology. I couldn't understand, God, what was going on. And it only lasted for about four and a half months. I could preach a whole sermon on that, but God doesn't want you living on just an emotional level. Also, there was people that attacked me and through criticism and things like that, the feeling, the emotion of it left. And one of the greatest things that ever happened to me was I got drafted and sent to Vietnam and it was awesome. 
Because in Vietnam, I was a chaplain's assistant without a chaplain. I didn't have a chaplain and they put me out on a fire support base and there was nothing to do. I volunteered for bunker guard every night just so I'd have something to do. And for 13 months, I just sat there and read the word and through the word, I began to start understanding some things. And I don't think I would have ever got it if I would have been back here in the States and have had things occupying me that would have taken my attention away. But I just forced myself to get into the word and I began to learn some things. And anyway, here's, here's what I was really wanting to share with you tonight. I had had this experience where I had dealt with my pride and my uh, arrogance and these things, and I had humbled myself. But I couldn't understand how God could love me after I saw my relative unworthiness and stuff like this. And I really believe that if God hadn't shown me some things, that that revelation of me not being worthy of any of God's blessings would have destroyed me. I'm not saying that it's not true, but it's like a coin. There's two sides to the coin. And you also have to recognize that even though you in yourself aren't worthy, that in Christ you're worthy. There is a new person on the inside of you. And what God began to teach me, and this is what I wanted to share with you. Some of you made a commitment that you wanted to deny yourself and put God first. You wanted to live for him. But here's a problem that hinders people from doing that. And that is many of you just see yourself. You were, you know, some of you are 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, whatever. And you have lived an entire life. If you haven't been under the control and the dominance of the Holy Spirit, I guarantee you, you have been one self-centered person because that is the normal way to be. That's the way that the world is. And even Christians we still have a self and most of us are ruled and dominated by self. And so there are many of you that have spent decades just living one way and you honestly can't see yourself any other way. I wanted to show this to you out of Galatians chapter five, verse 23. This is talking about the fruit of the spirit. This goes right along with what happy was sharing about who are you? What kind of man are you? And then he was talking about being led by the spirit. In Galatians chapter five, verse 23 or verse 22, it says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance against such. There is no law. Now I've got teaching on this for probably, I got probably six or seven hours worth of teaching on this. I'm not going to go into all of this, but let me just say, it says the fruit of the spirit and the word spirit here is capital S. Some people say, well, in the Greek, there isn't capitals and, and uh, lowercase letters. And so they say this means nothing. But the Greek had the equivalent of it. It may not have been shown by capitals and lowercase, but they, the context, the way that the words were grouped together, it got this across. I think it's appropriate to say that the fruit of the spirit, the Holy Spirit, this is what the Holy Spirit produces in your life. But also 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 says, He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. And the Greek word there for one is hes, H-E-I-S. And it means a singular one to the exclusion of another. It doesn't mean that we're parallel, that here's God up here and he's awesome and holy and you're down here. You're, you're kind of like him, but you're just worlds removed from him. No, in the spirit... It says that you are one spirit with the Lord. Your spirit is identical to the Holy Spirit. It was birthed by the Holy Spirit. You are a brand new creature. Happy to use that verse this morning. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 17. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. And one of the translations says you're a brand new species of being that never existed before. This is not out there someplace. It's not when we go to heaven, but right now in your spirit, you are completely changed. And again, I could minister on this for a very long time, but I wanted you to see in verse 23 that one of the fruit of the spirit that it mentions right here is meekness. And this is going to be a shock to some of you. But did you know that your spirit, your born again spirit is meek? 
you are humble. Your born again spirit never promotes itself. We could turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and look at God's kind of love. Verses four through eight talk gives you characteristics of God's kind of love. And it says it seeks not its own. Matter of fact, let me just read this. I'd misquote that if I tried to quote it. But 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where it's talking about God's kind of love. It says charity, that's God's kind of love, suffers long. Now remember that this is in your spirit, you have the fruit of of the spirit, which is love, God's kind of love. And it's also meekness and all of these things. This is who you are in the spirit. You suffer long and you're kind. Did you know that most of you, if I was to ask you to characterize yourself, what are you like? Many of you can describe your flesh to me. You can describe your personality. You can tell me that, well, you're a type A personality, that, you know, you sulk, you have a lot of depression, you deal with anger problems. You know, Clint was talking about PTSD. I really love that testimony. First time I'd heard that, Clint. But, you know, PTSD, all it is is people dealing with problems in the flesh. But in your spirit, your spirit is never stressed out over anything. It suffers long and it's kind is what it says. It envieth not, it wants not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, which is what pride is all about. Pride is about promoting yourself and stabbing somebody else in the back, taking care of yourself and doing whatever. God's kind of love, which you have in your born again spirit, is the exact opposite of pride. You are a humble person in your born again spirit. And some of you are looking at me right now and thinking, that's not me. It is you. It's the real you. And so what I'm trying to say through this is that, see, I had experienced seeing God's glory and my relative unworthiness. And I got a indelible imprint on me of my unworthiness. And I've never gotten over that. But that would have killed me if all I would have seen was my unworthiness. But on the other hand, God began to show me who I was in Christ. And in Christ, I am worthy. In Christ, I am absolutely awesome. In Christ, I've got love and joy and peace and all of these things. Long suffering, I'm meek. That is who I am. That's who you are. You have been recreated in his image. Your spirit is identical to Jesus. Whatever Jesus is like is what your born again spirit is like. Now y'all stop and think about this. If that's true, which I could, I could spend hours showing you scriptures where all of this is true. If that's true, then how come you don't describe yourself similar to Jesus? It's because most of us live in the flesh. Most of us, what we consider to be us, your personality is not your born again self, not who you are in the spirit. You are describing your flesh. You're describing your mental, emotional state. And man, this causes a huge problem. There are many of you that, you know, might leave this thing and you've been touched by the Lord and you see the benefit of living humbly and all of that, but you walk out of here and say, well, it's just not me. I've always been this way. I'm just, this is my personality and we feel locked, trapped in it. But I'm telling you, there is a brand new you on the inside. And if you could ever quit knowing yourself by just your past, I know that there's men right here who you've had problems in your marriage. You know, Clint talked about that. You didn't explain, is your marriage okay now? It's great. It's great. (laughs) He didn't give that part of the testimony. But, you know, he was having marital problems and all of these other things. There are some of you that have had that. You may have seen that you know you aren't loving to your wife the way you're supposed to be. You you don't think of them. You don't do things. And you're aware of it. But you know what? There's many people that respond by just saying, well, that's the way I am. That's the way my family's been. This is the way I was raised. You know, many of us were raised under this John Wayne model where you just don't show any emotion. You're this tough guy and you don't do these things. And you say, well, this is just the way I am. 
All you're doing is describing your flesh. I'm telling you, your spirit is full of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. That's who you are at your core. And some people think, well, I just can't go out and act the way you're telling me to. I'd be a hypocrite. Well, that's because you think your identity is in this physical, natural part of you. But there is a spiritual you on the inside that is exactly the way that the Word says. And actually, if you were to see yourself, if your identity was in who you are in Christ and not in your self-made person, not in your actions and not in all these external things, if your identity was in Christ, then you would be a hypocrite to act depressed, to act bitter, to act angry, to act these things. Because your spirit is never like that. Your spirit has never been depressed. Did you know every time you're depressed and you're saying, oh God, where are you? I just need a hug. I need something. You're in the flesh. Your spirit is always full of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Your spirit is never depressed. It's never scared. You're always bold and strong in the Lord. And many people just aren't acting that way because they don't, they don't know that this is who they are. They only think that what you feel and what you see is all that there is to reality. I'm telling you, when you got born again, you became a new creature in Christ Jesus, old things passed away. All things became new. That's not talking about your body. If you were fat before you got saved, you'll still be fat after you get saved. If you were a man before you got saved, you're going to be a man after you get saved. Your body did not change. It's not talking about your mind and your emotions. If you were just, you know, you still have your thoughts. You still have your mind. You still have your history when you get saved. You don't get my history you still retain your personality part. It's not talking about your body and your personality. Those parts haven't changed. But in your spirit, you are a brand new species of being that never existed before. And you are completely changed. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. So the problem is we aren't living in the spirit. We aren't walking in the spirit. We are walking in this flesh. And I've said all of these things. Now, if you followed me, you can say that the dominant trait of the flesh is pride, self-centeredness, self-promotion, thinking about self, worrying about self. But over here in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, God's kind of love, which is a fruit of the spirit, it suffers long and is kind. If you don't suffer long and is kind, did you know it's because you are in the flesh? You are living out of yourself. You are a prideful, self-centered, self-made man, and you are living by your own ability. If you were in the spirit, God's spirit has love, joy, and peace. It's long-suffering, and it's kind. You know, there's some of you that think, well, I'm just not that kind of a mushy person. I'm just not a kind person. I just don't express my feelings. I don't do this. Well, then you're just carnal. Because in the spirit, you are kind. Your spirit, God's kind of love is kind. And you know what? If you've just been raised one way and you aren't kind and you never show any affection and kindness towards your mate and stuff, well, then you just need to repent. You're in the flesh. You're proud. And some of you are making a decision. God, I want to die to myself. And yet you're going to go home and try and maintain your personality. You need to get rid of that old self. You need to quit building these walls around yourself and say this is the way I've always been. And you need to go to the word of God and find out what the word says, who you are. And you need to start being like that. I had a friend of mine in Chicago and this guy was raised in a home where both parents were alcoholics and they just stayed drunk constantly. And so as a result, when he was a little kid, he, he, they didn't buy him clothes. He would run around in his underwear for days and weeks at a time. He couldn't go to school. He was a drunk by the time before he was 10 years old. He was on dope. They would get him every once in a while and put him in school and buy him some clothes and he'd wear them until the clothes wore out and then he'd stay home. And anyway, he was raised in this terrible situation. He was a drunk, an alcoholic, a dope addict by the time he was 10 years old. 
And anyway, he just fried his brain and he stayed drunk or high uh, nearly most of his life. And around, I forget the exact age, but around 17 or 18, he was put in a mental ward. He was basically crazy. And he was in this mental ward and somebody came and witnessed to him and he got born again and committed his life to the Lord. And boom, he was just restored. He was delivered and he became a brand new person. But the problem was he didn't know who he was. He'd been drunk for 10 years. He'd been high on dope. He didn't have a history. He didn't have a personality. He didn't know who he was. And so the guy that led him to the Lord, he says, so how am I supposed to act? What am I supposed to do? And the guy said, well, here, here's a Bible. Just read about Jesus and whatever you see Jesus do, that's who you are. And so he just started acting like Jesus. And when I met this guy, he was so nice. He was so kind. I told Jamie, I said, I'm keeping my hand on my wallet. This guy is after something. Nobody treats you this nice. I said, he's buttering me up for something. And after he had given me over a hundred thousand dollars with no strings attached and had bought me cars and had done things, I finally said, you know what? There's no way he's ever going to get out of me what he's put into me. I said, this guy's bound to be real. But I had trouble relating to him because you know what? He didn't have the baggage that you and I have where we established that I'm this and this and this and this. He didn't, he didn't remember who he was. And so he just tried to be like Jesus. Would God ever one of us could lose our mind and lose our personality and we could just start being like Jesus. I'm telling you, man, some of you have been trained in a certain way. Your mind, your flesh, your carnal part of you is so fixed and so settled. Uh, Greg ministered on this about hardening your heart. Your heart is hardened. The word harden there when you're talking like this, it means to set or to fix. It's like concrete. When you were little, you were pliable, but you've been taught a certain way. And some of you have just developed a personality that stinks. And you know what? You're trapped by it. Well, this is just the way I am. Well, then you're just wrong. You need to repent. You need to humble yourself and you need to go to the word and find out, all right, I'm a new person. What is this new person like? I'm telling you, this new person has love, joy, peace. Every time you're depressed, your spirit has never been depressed. Your spirit can't be depressed. Every time you're saying, oh God, please touch me. I just need something. You've solved the problem. Some of you say, how's that? Because your spirit can't be depressed. You aren't in the spirit. You're in the flesh. You're going totally by your emotions. You are living like a person that hadn't even been saved. But in your spirit, your spirit's always rejoicing. And somebody said, but I don't feel that. Well, then just pull your thumb out of your mouth and quit going by how you feel and be a, a man and stand up and start doing what the word of God says. I don't care whether you feel it or not. In the spirit, you can't feel the spirit. I know we say things like you feel the spirit. I hadn't got time to go into that, but you're, the, Jesus said that which is flesh is flesh and that which is spirit is spirit. That's just saying that they're in different worlds. There is a spiritual realm that we can't see. I was talking uh, this morning or sometime about how Ted Mel had seen angels just shooting up into heaven and taking our praises to the Lord. People have seen angels sitting on these rafters and flowing in and out of these rafters. Did you know you can't see that with your physical eyes? But there is, it is spiritual that the Lord is rejoicing over us. There are angels in this room. There are demons in this room. And just because you say, I can't see them doesn't mean they're here. It just means you're carnal. There is a spiritual world, not only out there, but inside. There is a you on the inside that the average person functionally does not acknowledge that you're three parts. Most people only acknowledge your physical body and then your inner personality, emotional realm, and people think that's all there is. But the Bible teaches that there's a third part, the spirit, and it's this spirit that has love and joy and peace. You know, Happy and I were talking tonight and he just didn't feel peace about doing some things. Turned out to be a God thing that he didn't do it. And this is what the scripture says, Colossians 3.15. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. You may have turmoil out here in your emotions. You know, I don't have peace in my flesh about all of these buildings. I was, 
uh, you know, I hate to put a figure on it because it's not firm, but I'm going to need a hundred million dollars in the next two to three years to accomplish what God's telling me to do. And you know, in the flesh, I don't feel peace, (laughs) but in my spirit, there is complete peace. There is a, there is a peace that passes understanding. There is a peace that doesn't go with your feelings and emotions. And you are supposed to let this peace that's in your spirit, man, rule, umpire, dominate you. And most people just don't acknowledge that there is a third part. They try and, guys especially. You know, if your wives are watching on this, they are just shouting right now and saying amen. But women are more intuitive than men are. They go more by what they feel, not feel just physically, but in their heart. They go by premonitions and stuff. Men like to be logical and we're just going to figure things out and we're going to do all of this. And yet there is a spirit part of you that is illogical. It doesn't conform to the thinking of this world. And you've got to get to where you acknowledge who you are in the spirit. What kind of man are you? The truth is, if you've been born again, you are a God man that has love, joy, peace, all of these things. God's love is described as suffering long and being kind. If you got a short fuse, it's because you aren't walking in the spirit. You are walking in the flesh. You are going by your old self, your own personality, instead of going by what God says. And some of you are thinking, well, I just can't help it. That's who I am. No, it's not who you are. And that's the reason that you feel trapped is because you haven't seen who you are in Christ. I'm telling you, there is a new you. There is a part of you that isn't got, doesn't have a short fuse. that doesn't get ticked off. You know, I was in Charlotte, North Carolina, witnessing to this guy. And this guy had a big wad of chewing tobacco and he just spit it right in my face and it dripped down on my shirt. And you know what? My flesh wanted to punch this guy's lights out. Like, I just wanted to, anyway. (laughs) It didn't bless me. But you know what? I know that my, I know anything that contradicts what the Bible says about the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Anything that contradicts what Paul said here about God's kind of love, that is my flesh that feels that way, not my spirit. And I knew that Jesus, to the very people who were crucifying him, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's what, the, that's what Jesus would do. My spirit is united with Jesus. Whatever is true of him is true of me. That's the way I am in the spirit. And because I had this knowledge, I was able to wipe this off and keep talking to the guy. I never missed a word in the sentence and just kept talking to him, didn't get mad at him. I didn't do any of those things, not because I didn't have the potential of it or have the feelings of it in the flesh, but I found that there's more to me than just this flesh. Those of you who are saying, but I'm just being honest. No, you're just being carnal. You're just limited. You think that what you feel is the real you. That's not. There is a brand new you on the inside. And I'm telling you that you have, you are long suffering and you are kind. If you've been justifying, well, I'm just, you know, this is the way my family is. We just, we just, uh, you know, get mad at the drop of a hat and we do these things. And this is just the way that we are. I'm a type A personality. No, you're just carnal. There's a spiritual man on the inside that's exactly like Jesus. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, I am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest unto your souls. You have been birthed of God. It says in Galatians chapter four that God sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart crying, Abba, Father. And Jesus lives on the inside of you. And I'm telling you, Jesus is meek and lowly. You are meek and lowly in your spirit. Man, that's awesome. When I saw that, it just gave me an option. See, people that don't understand this, they think, well... I, I, you know, it sounds good, but this is just who I, I can't help it. 
You don't know who you are in Christ. In Christ, you're a brand new person that has been liberated and set free. There is no such thing as PTSD and all of these things. There is no such thing as depression. There is no such thing as fear in your spirit. All of those things are out in the flesh and the flesh, every one of those is tied to pride, promotion of self and just thinking about yourself. But if you are in God's kind of love, you will suffer long. You'll be kind. You will envy not. Did you know if you're jealous of other people, if you go to a class reunion and see other people who've succeeded and you haven't and it makes you jealous and you get to thinking, what about me? You know, I believe that all um, what they call midlife crisis, I believe all that is that most people just are doing their own thing in youth. They don't think about old days. They don't think about anything else. They're just out having partying and goofing off. And about midlife... It dawns on you, I'm halfway through. And you start pulling an inventory. What have I done? What, where am I going? And you realize you've wasted a large portion of your life and you get depressed and envious of other people who've succeeded where you haven't and stuff. That's all midlife crisis is, is you just finally measuring yourself up and realizing most of us come up short. Did you know if you were walking in God's kind of love, it would totally obliterate that. You would quit comparing yourself with other people and looking at this and that. And you would just go to God. God, what do you want me to do? And you find your total satisfaction in God, not in all of these other things that men get into. And it says here that um, it vaunteth not itself is not puffed up. That's just talking about it's not self-centered. It isn't self-promoting. It's not all about you. There's many things more important than you. And I know some of you right here, that is probably the first time you've ever had that thought in your life. There's many people that nothing's more important than me. Just about everything's more important than you. Now, again, there's a right place to have a godly opinion and stuff. But you know what? It's not about you. You know, in my personal life, it's not about me and what I do or a legacy or anything like this. It's about Jesus. I love Jesus. I want to know him and make him known. And because of that, I'm following his instructions and God is leading me and things is happening. But if, but if the Lord told me to go do something else, it's all about him. And it's, you know, I could walk away from this. And as long as I knew I was in the center of his will and that God was pleased with my response to him. I could be happy if nobody knew who I was, if nobody ever came and listened to me, if I was on the other side of the world or whatever. That's a huge statement right there. That's big. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of men sitting right here that you couldn't walk away from things that you've got because that is where your identity, that's where It's all about you. It's all about what you've been able to accomplish and stuff. And I'm telling you, someday you're going to get old and you aren't going to be as productive. And and the moment that that happens, if your self-worth is tied up in performance, you are going to crash and burn and you're going to exit in a whimper instead of in a blaze of glory. That's not the way you're supposed to do it. Does not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. This is one of the characteristics of God's kind of love. It does not seek its own way. You know, I went home a little bit this afternoon and Jamie was watching some Hallmark show. I didn't even get into it, but they just had these boy and a girl who were getting married, but the mothers on both sides hated each other. And when they found out that the daughter and the son were marrying their mutual enemies, uh, you know, son and stuff, that's what the whole thing was about. And I just watched a few minutes of it, and it was all self. It was all about people seeking themselves. Something had happened, and it was all about self. And they were hurting everybody. The couple that wanted to get married, they didn't care about them. They didn't care about what was happening to them. It wasn't pleasing them. They didn't want this other woman as an as a in-law. And it was just all about self. That's exactly what Proverbs 13, 10 said last night when we were studying that about only by pride comes contention. It's only your self-focus that causes problems. 
It's because you're thinking about what's going to happen to me if I lose this job. What happens to me if I don't get this promotion? What happens to me? It's all because you are focused on self that causes all of these travail. Paul said, I'm going to finish my course with joy because I do not count my life dear unto myself. So if he was in prison, it didn't matter. He was still worshiping the Lord. He was doing what God told him to do and he could finish his course with joy because it wasn't all about himself. Man, these are powerful things I'm saying. It's not easily provoked. Let me just ask you guys, how many of you are easily provoked? I didn't want you to raise your hand. <laughs> There's some people who raised your hands. This was a rhetorical question. Here. Let me ask you, let me say it this way. How many of your wives would say that you are easily provoked? Some of you might have a higher opinion of yourself than your wife, but if we were to ask your wife, how many of you, you know, if I could talk to the wives and say, how many of these guys, man, have a short fuse, get ticked off easily? You know, that, that's just your flesh. That's because you are living a prideful, independent life where you are not under the control of the Holy Spirit. You didn't humble yourself. You are living by your standards. You are promoting yourself. If you are living by God's kind of love, you will not be easily provoked. You will think no evil. Man, that's huge. I could spend a long, long period of time on that. But many of us just sit there and think things that we know we shouldn't be thinking on. God's kind of love, you would humble yourself. You'd take those thoughts captive according to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And then it says, it rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Look at this in verse seven. It says, God's kind of love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. God's kind of love never fails. How many times when I was pastoring, did people come in and say, well, I've tried to make this marriage work, but you know, I can only endure so much. Well, according to this, God's kind of love endures all things. So when you say, I can't endure it anymore, you said, I'm not walking in God's kind of love. I'm not living out of the spirit. I'm living as a carnal, physical person, separate from what Jesus has done in my life. I'm going to operate in my ability because if you were operating in God's kind of love, you can endure all things. Not a lot of things, but all things. There is no limit to your spiritual man's ability to endure. And it says it endures. Or it says, first of all, it bears all things. I've also heard people say, I, I, you know, I just can't bear this anymore. Well, you've solved the problem. You're in the flesh. You aren't living out of your spirit. You are living a prideful, independent life of God. You're going by your own reservoir, your own capabilities. You aren't drawing on God's capabilities. God, if you are living by God, you can bear all things. You can believe all things. I've had so many people say, I just don't believe that our marriage will work anymore. I just don't believe that I can make this job work. I just don't believe that God can do this. Well, if you've said any of those things, you're in the flesh. You're in your own self. You are living in pride, independent of God. It may not be arrogance. You might be condemned and feeling so unworthy, but you are focused on yourself and living out of yourself. God gives you supernatural ability so that you can bear all things, believe all things, hope all things. Man, how many times have people told me all my hope is gone? Well, God's kind of love hopes all things. If you were walking in the spirit, which is full of love, God's kind of love, joy, peace, and all of these things, then you would be able to hope when there is no hope. It talks about Abraham in Romans chapter four, verse 18, who against hope believed in hope. When there was no hope, he still had hope. You know why? Because he was operating out of the, uh, out of the spirit of God. Now we have something even better. We don't just have the spirit of God imparting these things to us. Our spirit has been born again. And we now have these same things in us. You have this hope living on the inside of you. So if you're saying, I just don't have any more hope, you've solved the problem. You're just living out of yourself. 
instead of living out of God. You know, when I went to Pritchett, Colorado, I held a meeting there and a man was raised from the dead. Pritchett, Colorado had 144 people in the whole town. And uh, there was about 10 people in this church. And I ministered and one of the guys there was raised from the dead and we started having 100 people come to church out of 144. The next closest town was 30 miles away and it had 100 people. And I mean, it was out in the middle of nowhere. And anyway, I went to this church and not long after I got there, uh, b bad things happened. I talked last night about one of the elders who lied about me and said I was committing adultery and stealing money and doing all of these things. And I had people start fighting me and it was just, it was bad. And you know what? I was feeling like there was no hope. Like I couldn't bear this anymore. I just can't believe anymore. I was feeling all of these things in the natural. And I had given up everything. I didn't have a lot by most people's standards, but for the first time in my life, I was succeeding in Childress, Texas. We had about 50 to 60 people coming to church. I, it looked like we were going to live and not die. And I gave it all up to go to this little tiny church of 10 people. And when I got there, they didn't appreciate it. And they were giving me a hard time. And so anyway, I was just waiting on Jamie and the boys to go to bed. And then I was going to go down into the basement and just have a pity party and gripe and complain and tell God about how I felt. And I mean, I had sent out all my invitations. All of the demons in Baca County were waiting on me to get down there and just wallow in self-pity and all of this stuff. And while I was waiting on Jamie and the boys to go to bed, I just sat down at the table and I just flipped my Bible open and it flipped open to... Uh, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And I started reading that in the spirit is love and joy. And I knew what the Lord was telling me. And I knew that in my spirit, I had love, joy, and peace. And was I going to operate in the spirit and go by what God said I had? Or was I going to let my feelings dominate me? And man, I did not want to hear that. I thought, God, I would be better off if I just griped for a while. If I got all of this out, I'd feel better. This is what the world will tell you, that you can't deny it. You're, you're in denial. Well, I am in denial. I'm denying that this physical flesh and feeling and emotion part of me is all that there is. There is a spirit man on the inside of me that is identical to Jesus. And it has everything that Jesus is. It's sealed by the Holy Spirit. It never gets polluted. It never changes. I am perfect and pure and clean and holy on the inside. And anything in me that wants to quit, gripe, complain, and give up is not in my spirit. It's in my flesh. And I am denying that all I am is a physical human being with physical emotions. There's a spiritual part of me that is greater than any of these problems that are coming against me. And so, yeah, I do deny that. I don't deny that feelings exist, but I deny that that's all there is to me. There's a spiritual part to me that I've learned through the word of God, what it's like. And so I was sitting there at this table and I was thinking all of these things and I was saying, Oh God, but I just want to gripe. I want to complain. I want to be depressed. And, you know, the Lord just spoke these things to me. He won't argue with you. He just reminded me of it and then kind of left me to make my decision. Which do I want to do? And by the time Jamie and the boys got to bed, I decided, you know what? I'm going to act on who I am in Christ. And I went down into the basement and through gritted teeth, I did not feel joy. I did not feel peace. I didn't feel any of these things, but I just started acting on what the word said. And I said, Father, I thank you that I do have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. As Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. Stephen did it. says, lay not this sin to their charge. Father, I start blessing these people. I didn't feel like blessing these people. I was going to complain about them and ask God to get them. <laughs> but I started acting on what the word said. And you know what? That is what the Bible calls walking in the spirit. 
Walking in the Spirit isn't going around with your hands folded and with a sick look on your face and sprinkling holy water or having your collar turned around backwards. That's not walking in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit is just walking in who you are in Christ as the Bible reveals it instead of going by what you feel. And I'm telling you, I was talking against selfishness and against pride and against exalting ourselves. And the reason I'm bringing these things out tonight is to say some of you feel like, but I just, I hadn't got any options. This is just who I am. No, there is a brand new you on the inside that when you got born again, you became a new creature. Old things passed away. All things became new. And this new creature is defined in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, 1 uh, Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. And it's long suffering. It's kind. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love on the inside of you, that born again self never fails. And if you feel anything contrary to that, then you've identified which part of you it's coming from. It's coming out of your carnal, physical, natural self. You know, there are some people that when you start talking about who you are in Christ, I don't know exactly how they do this, but it seems to me like they say, well, there is a positional truth and then there's a physical truth. In other words, in the na this is the way it really is. You're just a mean, angry, bitter person. That's the real, that's reality. But on, in God's sight, on the books, in a theoretical sense, you are a new creature who has love, joy, and peace, etc. And some people see that as this is your potential. This is what you could become. Uh, it's written down in heaven, but it's not a reality. But I'm telling you, what I'm talking about is reality in your spirit. There is a you on the inside that is longing to get out. And it is all of these things that we've been talking about. It's not just theory. The real you... The part of you that's going to live forever is awesome. It is absolutely awesome. You know, if every wife of every man in this place could live with a person who is manifesting who you really are in Christ, your marriage would be wonderful. If your wife was living with Jesus... Man, you'd be amazed at how nice and how kind she would be. But many of them have justifications. Not, well, that's the wrong word. They have excuses for treating you the way you do because of the way you treat them. And so they justify it in their own mind and stuff. And of course, the wife is supposed to be treating us as Jesus would treat us too. So it's a two-way street. But I'm saying that there are many of us that just act ungodly because this is our personality. This is the way we've always been. I'm telling you, you got changed. There's a new you on the inside. And this new you is characterized by the antithesis of pride. Everything that pride is, your born again spirit isn't. Pride will not be full of love, joy, and peace, long suffering, all of these things. But yet that's who you are in the spirit. That's the core of you. And I'm telling you, brothers, the key to the Christian life is discovering what Jesus did for you, who he made you to become. You are in your spirit right now exactly the way that Jesus is. And I know some of you struggle with this because you go look in the mirror and you think this is like Jesus. No, he's not like your physical body. And then you search your emotions and your mental part. And you think this is like Jesus. He thinks like this, feels like this. No, he's not like your physical, natural personality. But there is a spirit being on the inside and you are identical to him. First John chapter four, verse 17 says, Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, speaking of Jesus, so are we in this world. It didn't say so are we going to be in the next world. It says you are identical to Jesus right now. That's not talking about your body. That's not talking about your mind and your emotions, but in your spirit, you are identical 
to Jesus. It is His Spirit living on the inside of you. And I'm telling you, Jesus was characterized by giving His life. He says, no greater love hath any man than this, that He laid down His life for His friend. And He says, you are my friends. Jesus thought more of us than He thought of Himself. That's humility. Pride is thinking more of yourself than you think of others. And it doesn't have to be thinking of yourself as better than everybody else. Just think of yourself as worse than everybody else. But just stay focused on yourself to where you're always thinking about yourself. That's pride. Humility is just putting other people ahead of yourself. And you know this example that I started with tonight when the Lord met me March the 23rd, 1968, and I had this encounter I expected God to kill me, and when he didn't, and when he showed me love and acceptance, I was so grateful, I was so thankful for God doing that, that, man, I gave him everything I've got. As an 18-year-old kid, I have never gone back on that. Now, I failed. I failed constantly. I never have done everything perfectly, but I guarantee you, it has been my all-consuming desire for the last 47 years to give God everything I've got. I don't do it perfectly, but that has been my desire, and that desire has never changed. I mean, I have wanted to live for God. And if you humble yourself and then begin to find out what He's done for you, I guarantee you that will be your response. You will get to where you will exalt him and you will be so thankful to him for what he's done for you that you literally will lay your life down. You know, the very first thing that the Lord spoke to me after I had this experience with him, he told me to quit school, which that isn't for everybody. You, you, if you're going to be a doctor, praise God, I hope you go to school and learn what you're doing. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with school, but for me, God told me to quit school. And at this time, that was the height of the Vietnam War. I had a student deferment. If I stayed in school, I had $350 a month coming from my father's social security as long as I stayed in school. And I had the acceptance of people, but boy, God told me to quit school. And when I made that announcement, I mean, I got kicked out of a church. They were said, you say, they told me, says, you can't claim to be a Christian and say God would tell you to quit school. And I literally got kicked out of our Baptist church. My mother wouldn't talk to me for weeks and stuff. I lost my $350 a month from the government and I was immediately classified 1A and drafted and sent to Vietnam. And it could have cost me my life. But did you know, I was just so thankful after seeing how ungodly I was and how unworthy of anything I was, and then God just poured his love out in my life, I would have done anything. I went to Vietnam, and I, I nearly got killed twice in one day. I came close to death many times, and you know what? It was no problem because I was doing what God told me to do, and if God wanted me to die in Vietnam, that would have been fine with me. And I know some of you are thinking, you can't live this way. Well, don't wake me up because this is how I'm living. I am, you can question me and say, I don't, you know, you're just a preacher. You're saying these things, but that's not reality. I'm telling you, this is exactly the way it is. I've, I've done this many a times and I am just so thankful that if I know for sure God wants me to do something, I'll do it or die trying. There's no debate about it. You can get to a place to where it just, it relieves you of so much. I don't have to build this bill. I don't have to do these things. All I've got to do is respond to God and trust him and believe it. And I have to make clear my vision so that people can see. And there's things that I have to do, but it's not on my shoulders to produce all of this money. I don't wake up at night and lay awake wondering, oh God, what am I going to do? <laughs> Man, it's his responsibility and to the best of my ability, I'm listening to him and letting him guide me. I'm telling you, this is a better way to live than what most people are living. To where you are the one that has to get everything accomplished. You're a self-made man. You can do it on your own. Man, I pity you. 
I pity you. Even if you're doing good right now, you will mess up. You will fail and you will come under all the guilt and condemnation that goes along with it. I'm telling you, there's a better way to live and that's just to walk humbly with your God. You know, I'd have to look up the verse right now. I should know this, but it's over in Malachi or Micah or one of those minor prophets. It says, what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, how does it go? Where is it? Micah 5 eight. Let me just, 6 eight. Let me turn over here and read this. Micah. Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, 6, 8. Somebody's saying, oh, let me look here. I'll find it real quick. It's 6, 8. He has showed the old man what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. That's just it. That's real simple. Just to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Humbly is not doing your thing and asking God to bless it. But just, God, what do you want to do? What do you want me to do? And when God tells you, you just follow it. You know, I never ask God to bless what I'm doing. I have yet to ask God for money or to bless me and to help me to get these things done. I just say, God, what do you want me to do? And once the Lord tells you something to do, well, then it's his responsibility to make it happen. And my only responsibility is respond to him. But there are so many people that you want this, and so you're asking God to bless it, and you're trying to get God to bless your plans. That's not the way it works. You just come to the Lord and say, God, I have no plans. My only goal in life is to know you and to make you known. What do you want me to do? And then when God tells you, if God tells you to do it, he would be unjust to tell you to do something and then not supply. You know, God would be unjust to give me a vision of a hundred million dollars in two or three years that I have to come up with and then leave me to myself to do it. That's unjust. That's not the way that God works. God will just speak to you and tell you what he wants you to do. And then it's up to God how he gets it done. Now, you have to listen to him and continue to walk with him, and he'll tell you things to do. But it's, the responsibility has to be on him. And because of that, I never beg God to do something. I never pray. I never stay up. Oh, God, you got to move. God has already provided everything. Wherever he guides, he provides. It's going to all come to pass. And I can sleep at night. Don't worry about stuff. Brothers, I believe that God is speaking to many people here this weekend. And either you're making a course correction or you're getting marching orders of things that you, he's wanting you to do. But we need to humble ourselves. And what does God want you to do? You know, I, I have a, a teaching that entitled uh, how to find, follow, and fulfill God's will. In the very first part of it, I teach about how God's got a plan for every person and I show from scriptures multitude of people who, while they were still in their mother's womb, God spoke to them and had plans for them. And after I show that it's not up to us to just pick and choose and do what we want to do, but God created you for a purpose, then I'll give an invitation and I'll say, how many of you in here know for sure that you're doing what God created you to do? Are, are you just asking God to bless your plans? And among spirit-filled Christians... Probably a minimum is 70% of people will stand to say they don't know for sure. And it's up to 90% sometime. The average Christian is doing your thing. You just let life kind of, you're like a pinball that you just pull back the thing and you launch it. And then just boing, boing, boing. It depends on what happens in your life. You go over here, somebody offered you a job, you married this person and their dad had this business and and you just let life dictate you and you've never heard from God what you're supposed to do. Man, that's a terrible, terrible way to live. This is not a dress rehearsal. We aren't practicing for something. 
every day the sun comes up and sets, you've had 24 hours go that you could either be moving towards what God created you for or you are burning daylight. You're wasting time. You need to find out what God has for your life and then you need to respond to him. And when you find out what God's plan for you is, there's an anointing on that. You will succeed in ways that you could never succeed on your own. I don't care if you go to school and get all this training and do all of these things. God made you for a purpose and you need to humble yourself and quit doing your own thing and asking God to bless it. And you need to just find out what does God have for you and then you need to follow him. Do justly and walk humbly with your God. Just humble yourself and follow him. And if you'll do that, I guarantee you, you will finish your course with joy. You won't be moved by all of these things that come against you. You'll be a blessing to other people. It'll just transform every single thing. I'm telling you, all of the problems in our life Satan uses pride as his beach, beachhead, his landing zone. This is how he gains access into your life. And you need to turn from that. And the good news is if you're born again, you got a brand new person on the inside that's full of love, joy, peace, humility, all of these things. And you do not have to be trapped in that person that you have been making for decades. Man, that's awesome. I, pr I pray that you understood what I've said. This changed my life. It gave me an option. Prior to this time, I just thought that what I felt and what I saw, that was it. And I thought I was dealing with reality. I was only playing with half a deck. I didn't understand who I was in Christ. And when I saw this, it gave me an option. And I said, I want to be this person. I want to be who Jesus called me to be. And I just started trying to be like that. Even though it felt awkward at first and felt hypocritical, I just started being what God said. And I challenge you tonight. Would to God everybody in here could lose your mind, lose your personality, and just become the person that God wants you to be. Amen. Amen. Father, I pray for all of my brothers in here, all the people that are watching by live streaming. Father, I know these things to be true, and I am asking that the Holy Spirit would confirm this, bear witness in people's hearts. That, Father, you would help people who have been cursed by their parents, cursed by ex-mates, cursed by bosses, cursed by themselves, that this is just the way that they are and that they're just being real. Father, I pray that you'd convict these people and show them that that's just being carnal and that there's a brand new person on the inside and that they can be this person. That, Father, they can change, that you can transform their life. They do not have to live trapped in all of these things. They do not have to approach their problems as a mere human being. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit just makes this real to people, that you set people free. Thank you, Jesus. You know, the Bible teaches that the Lord's always with us. But there's also a passage where it says that, that the presence of the Lord or the power of the Lord was present to heal. God was always with Jesus, but sometimes the anointing of God was manifest greater than others, not because God changes, but because we change. And sitting under the word opens our hearts up and it changes us. And I just perceive that right now, that even though the Lord is always with us, there is a manifested presence of the Lord. There is a manifested anointing. And God is touching people's hearts right now. The power of the Lord is present to heal, not only physical bodies. Did you find that verse? Yeah, where is that? What's the reference? There, thank you very much. Luke 5, 17. Awesome. And uh, the presence of the Lord is present. The power of the Lord is present to heal. And right now, I believe that God is touching people's lives, but it needs a response of faith, a positive response on our part. And so I don't know exactly how to do this, but I'd like to just say this. If some of you have, if this is revelation to you, what I was saying tonight, and you did not realize that you're this brand new person, you've been trapped in your carnal self, and you've been 
trapped in this personality that's developed over decades and stuff. And you just felt like I can't be different. And tonight God spoke to you. And if you receive that, and if you're saying tonight, I'm going to change. I'm going to start renewing my mind. I'm making a decision that, praise God, I'm changing. I'm going to find out, and I'm going to start acting like this godly person. Now, you don't, it, you're going to have to gain a lot of information. I just I gave a brief sketch tonight. There's a lot more to it than what I said. But if you are willing to receive that and saying tonight, praise God, I'm going to change, and I'm going to go back a different person. And stuff. I want to just give you an opportunity to respond. I believe the power of the Lord is present to deliver you and to break that old carnal self and stuff. If that's you, I want you to be bold enough to stand right where you are and I'm going to lead you in a prayer and praise God. We're going to make some decisions to change. Thank you, Jesus.